Mundo. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald, and the Gestalten Podcast, as always, is presented to you by Concept House, and this time by Concept House Design, your number one creative design, especially for the transportation industry, headhunting and contracting source. So if you are looking for a job at the moment, or you would like to fill a few jobs, feel free to get in touch on the description below. And to come to our episode this time, I'm very happy to welcome Wayne Burgess for this episode. Um, a lot of you might know Wayne, he used to be the Jaguar design chief, then he moved on to Geely in the UK and led the studio over there. He was also at Aston Martin, was involved in the DB9, so he really is a household name in the industry. And I had the pure pleasure to talk with him about a little bit the future of transportation design and not just in this like oh you know we have these in this kind of uh, positions now a little bit further than that we talked a lot about uh what the process is going to be like which kind of new position we will probably see in a design studio which was very interesting and we talked a little bit about the role of the uk um over the past years and uh, and the future and maybe we will even see you know some of the old defunct brands coming back to life who knows we discussed this uh, in quite detail it was an hour long conversation so i hope you really enjoy it as much as both wade and i did and without further ado enjoy the conversation with wayne burgess let's go wayne burgess welcome to the show welcome to the gestalten podcast and i do very much appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for joining me. It's uh, it's my pleasure, Martin. As you know, I uh, always enjoy a conversation with you. Let's let's see if we can keep this one to less than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So obviously, we had a few conversations beforehand, and uh, I think it was you who then said, like, "Oh, you know, maybe we should record this actually." And now, now we're doing this, and we want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the the state of car design. I think in general, like you know, transportation design, and uh, what we can expect in the future, and we'll obviously include the UK a little bit into that. But um, as a starting question, and I'll make this. Um, very broad you've obviously been in one of the biggest kind of car manufacturers also with the biggest kind of history in terms of jaguar you've been to aston you've worked for geely of course as well um if i would ask you the question what's what's the state of the the, the car design or transportation design industry right now as we speak what would be your answer um, well, I, I guess there are, there are lots of aspects to consider. Uh, the, the one thing that we can't ignore in any conversation at, at this point in history is the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the way that all industries are working. And um, certainly the, the observation that I would make first and foremost is that, you know, how we suspect it was possible, but this pandemic has made it a necessity. You, you can actually work creatively very effectively remotely. So designing cars uh, from home, as it were, um, it's actually much more achievable than I think we probably wanted to acknowledge before we were you know, forced into a situation where we had to adopt remote working policies. But the technology is so good these days, the software, the visualization we're able to achieve uh, and even, you know, the, the simplest sort of communication tools like Zoom or Teams, for example, I found it's, it's really useful using those to have reviews with uh, digital modelers, for example, because I can draw on their screens in real time. They can see exactly what I'm talking about. And actually, it's more effective than standing next to a digital modeler in a studio where, you know, I'm jotting down sketches on a, a piece of paper or in a pad to try and convey an idea, I can actually draw on his screen and he can see exactly what lines I'm wanting to move to where. Um, so I've been surprised and pleased by how effective that way of working uh, really is. Um, and that kind of then takes us, as, as you and I have mentioned before, Martin, takes you to another conversation, which is, well, moving forwards, if you were a new company, if you were a startup, 
you know, electric manufacturer, would you would you invest in a large studio now, or would you would you go for a much smaller facility with the opportunity to work remotely with your team and and embrace the technology and work that way? Because it has raised a, a question to me about you know how much do we need a a huge design facility to really create vehicles if we put our faith in the technology and and really leverage how good it is at visualization now. Hmm. Then let me let me ask you this. I mean, there's there's always this argument that comes up, especially with with top level management, and we we see this a lot in China. But it's you know it's a very understandable um, argument to make is that well, the low the closer we are to production, to engineering, and all these kind of things, uh, the more effective we can work, of course, in in one location. Now, with this with this pandemic. Of course, we will, I think, see a, a long-term switch as well. That not everything has to be done internally. Uh, you know, the the work methods need to change a little bit. They have to be much more flexible um, from that side as well. Now, you as a you know executive in in the car design industry, where would you say things need to happen on site, and where would you say, like, look, I, maybe I don't need to see these guys all the time. Maybe I don't need to see them at all. Where, at, where where do you where do you draw the line of saying this is a necessity to be on site? Because I'm sure in in particular in your kind of position, the the factor of being on site with meetings with you know decision makers with you know the business lunches you know how it is, is uh, is is much more important than let's say for your just a creative team and we're not you know especially in early phases when it comes to competitions and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think. It- It ultimately comes down to the the processes a company chooses to adopt. Um, if, if you're if you're an established OEM um, and many and you are, then you will already have a large facility. You will be very much into 3D modeling at an early stage in the program because that's how you've always been set up to work. It's historically the way that we create cars, uh, and therefore, if you've got the physical property in the room and you've got a facility that's geared up to deliver physical properties. And it makes sense that you try and organize meetings around them. And, you know, the designers always talk about the sort of, you know, the emotional impact of seeing a car full size. And there's, there's, there's truth in that, absolutely. Especially when you're working with an engineering team that maybe has a lot of um, conflicting requirements that really are demanding that the A surface moved. Uh, and the design team needs to demonstrate face to face, if you like, what the impact of adding 50 millimeters to the roof line to achieve a, uh, a headroom target means to the overall proportions of the car. Um, I think in those situations, it is important to have something physical, but it's, it's when in the process you need to have those conversations. I mean, something occurs to me as we're having this, this discussion is that those specific engineering and design sort of trading conversations about normally package versus a surface They are quite difficult to show on anything other than a. If you had a power wall and you were all in the same room, you could do it. But if you were trying to convey a 50 millimeter move on a, a roof um, via a, a laptop screen, it might be more difficult to appreciate what that means. I, I now realize, as, as I say, as we're discussing this, because obviously at the scale of a, a, an average laptop screen, 50 millimeters is, you know, three or four millimeters on the image. Um, so I think in those situations, if it was something that was as critical as, as that, I've kind of exaggerated to make an effect, that's maybe where teams need to come together. But again, you know, the more that we get used to working digitally and remotely, the more I would under, I would hope that we, we create an empathy between the teams. I mean, if I just refer to my Geely experience regarding engineering and design working together, we had a really successful relationship with the uh, Chinese-based engineering team. Um, through regular teleconferencing, it was a it was a daily occurrence, and because we were talking so regularly, and they we quickly grew an understanding for each organization, and, and and they learned where sensitivities were from a design point of view. So I, I'm not I'm I'm not saying that you you absolutely have to be in the same room and look at something physical together. We can assist the conversation sometimes, but also if you you know if you're in regular dialogue remotely. You can build up a relationship and an understanding that can also circumnavigate those difficult conversations. Yeah, would you say 
Now, this is this is this is a trend that I see at the moment, but I would love to hear your opinion about this. Um, when you were a Jaguar, and, and I include Land Rover in this as well. I mean, this was this was quite a big design team. Obviously, it came with the fact that you know there was quite a lot of products that came out of of that time as well. At what point would you say there is maybe even too many people in a process to make it as efficient as it could be? Because what I always see and like the conversations I have with higher level management, it's oftentimes this, you know, this this statement of like, maybe we don't need as many people as we have. Maybe we just need to make sure that these people have more responsibilities, but we need to make sure that obviously everybody's on, you know, everybody's under work and like everybody's under bread and butter and that kind of sense. What for you is like the perfect size of a studio to be both efficient um, as well as obviously quick in the process, but still keeping the quality that's, that, that, that's expected of you? And how do you balance that? I mean, the UK, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, of course, as well, but the UK is generally very contract heavy. I'm based in Germany where we're very permanent heavy. Where's the line? Or what's, what's from your experience the best kind of, the best kind of setup? Well, I think scale and agility uh, definitely are, you know, directly connected. Uh, the smaller the team, the more agile the team, the faster you can make decisions and, and move forward with the program. Um, and also, it, I guess it depends on, you know, where you dr where you draw the boundaries around the team in terms of delivering a car. You know, is it are we talking about just the uh, conceptualization and realization of a car to say surface transfer for example which is dominantly design activity or are we talking about delivering a car to production which of course then embraces a very big piece of engineering activity um the the, the one observation i would make is that you find that companies grow and become larger by scale they naturally have to have more processes and the more processes a company has the slower it tends to move and the more people within the company seem to be focused on making sure that the processes are adhered to, whereas smaller organizations don't have such a, a big number of processes written down around them. So they can they move through the process of creating a car much more quickly and, and easily. Um, for me, just going back to your original question, what's, what's an ideally sized team? Um, I've worked with such a variety of, of, of team sizes over the years You know, I've been used to, for the last decade, working with sort of 100 people or so in the, in the team. But that's been, as you described, with Jaguar Land Rover on a lot of programs simultaneously. Um, it's quite nice to sort of scale that back. I mean, I I think you could, uh, you could deliver a, a car. You know, if a team was made up of studio engineers, you know, a, a program manager, some digital modelers, let's talk about the traditional way of doing things, let's put in some clay modelers there as well, and then obviously creative designers, CMF designers and so on, you could probably create a car very effectively and efficiently for reasonable volume production with a team of less than 50, um, you know, if, if you were working efficiently. Um, if you drop much below that number, just because of the sheer number of disciplines involved in creating a car these days, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, you know, the how important UX UI design has become to the, the process of car design and how important it's going to be to customers moving forward and critically so. You know, it's not like when I started designing nearly 30 years ago where you basically needed an exterior designer, an interior designer, four clay models for the exterior, four clay models for the interior, a couple of studio engineers and a color materials designer, and off you went. Um, it's, we're not in that world now and the product isn't based around those very simple building blocks, the you know the the user interface, the the ecosystem around the product is becoming so important now that you quite often find that the biggest team in a design studio is the UX UI team. Mm. Do you think that because of this implementation of UI UX, like a general kind of experience that the the car itself should represent of the company as well, that the role of the, let's say, transportation designer, as we know it right now, with the split of exterior, interior, will change um, so that we, let's say, have 
not this traditional kind of exterior interior split anymore. Maybe, of course, for specialists, I mean, you will always need the specialists to really understand to bring something into production, the tooling and everything that is involved. But um, do, do you think that especially, you know, kids coming out of school right now should should be more multifaceted in terms of what they're doing, uh, in particular in this, in this, in this full context of what, what, how complex car design is nowadays? Oh, absolutely, Martin. I, I, I totally agree. I, um, I think we're already seeing that uh, not only from the, the you know, the, the transport solution as a product in itself, but also from what new generations of, of transport consumers want from a product. Um, you know, the importance of ecosystems, let's talk about that first and foremost. You know, to, to the sort of 16-year-olds uh, of this current generation, uh, Transport represents a very different um, uh, thing to them compared to my generation where, you know, at the age of 16, I was learning how to drive, getting ready to buy my first car because that represented uh, uh, personal freedom, the opportunity to travel outside of the immediate area where I lived, to visit friends at university 40, 50 miles away. It represented independence. It was a little bit of a rite of passage into adulthood. But of course, nowadays, um, children probably have their own smart device or mobile phone from mine are old enough yet, but I'm guessing the age of 11 or 12, because at that point, you want them to be able to get in touch with you if they are stuck at football training or whatever. Um, so they, they're they used to being able to, commu uh, to communicate with their friends and their family. I mean, our boys steal my wife's phone already quite often to talk to their grandparents, and they'll disappear off into another room and we hear them giggling and they're FaceTiming grandma or, or grandpa, which is lovely. But the point I'm making is that they don't need to get into a car to go and see grandma or grandpa. They can see them in the palm of their hand on mummy's smartphone. So they are very used to a world where apps and the interfaces that we have via smart devices are how they are used to communicating. Uh, and therefore, I think that you know, the, their desire to own their own vehicle to travel around is probably considerably diminished compared to somebody of my generation because they can, they can talk and speak and, and, and see and do things with people all around the world from the palm of their hand already, which I think leads us into sort of like the, the acknowledgement at the very least that this generation of teenagers that, you know, are now coming of age and could be buying cars and so on, are likely not to in the first instance, generally because they'll probably use subscription services, they're already using Uber and so on, but they'll be wanting that extension of the subscription service to be coming from the manufacturers as well. And again, going back to UNGUI design, you know, the look and feel of the app that a manufacturer or a transportation subscription service chooses is going to be, I think, play a major or play a major part in the decision factors as to who they go with. Because you'll be looking at how cool the app is on the phone compared to Facebook, Google, or whatever, rather than going to a car dealer and staring at the exterior shape of a car to inform your decision, which is historically how my generation went about things. So, yes, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, the next generation of transport designers will have to be multifaceted. And thankfully, they already they are becoming that way. But I think, you know, the, the days of exterior styling being the most important aspect of, of transportation design they're already gone in my opinion i think you know my generation probably likes to cling on to the notion but i don't think it's really true i think it even goes further than this i mean if you look into and you know you see that with your kids and uh, you know we, but we see that pretty much on 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 every outlet at the moment is that this this generation nowadays that's that's up and coming they they look at things differently. You know, we have Friday for Futures, which is a which is a youth group, pretty much. Like, you know, I mean, it's somewhere between twelve to probably thirty um, that look into environmentally reasons. Um, we you know have young people using scooters rather than any kind of rental cars or something like that. So I think you know having that in mind, I think what what what's going to change for the future of car design. Uh, or like, you know, transportation design in general is a much more, you know, cohesive and coherent approach to what it is. I think the designer of the future 
which for me personally is a good thing. There will be fewer really professional you know, transportation designers, because I think at the moment we just have too many. I feel so sorry for a lot of young kids that come out of, you know, Coventry or CCS or Art Center, wherever they go. And it's so difficult for them to find a job. But I think the expectations of a car designer or a transportation mobility designer, whatever you want to call call it, um, will be so much more advanced. Because if you think about it, you need to know about your environment. You need to know probably basics about architecture. You need to know basic about you know uh, how how a, a vehicle is built, but you need to understand how how does this product fit into our environment? How does this product fit into you know a certain kind of sustainable thinking process uh, in the future as well? Because this generation that's coming up now, you know, it's not just about the electric vehicles or like uh, hydrogen. It's about much more than that. It's about materials, of course, as well. And uh, that's something for me where I see. Uh, the change process becoming very radical because, you know, this general kind of, oh, you know, here's a great exterior guy and, you know, some really cool sketches uh, will not be, you know, sufficient anymore. I think a lot of people in your position in the next five to 10 years will ask the questions like, and, you know, what does this to our environment? Uh, I don't think that, you know, uh, the especially the car companies will be in this kind of position that say, like, look, we tell the client or, you know, our customers what, what we think is right. But uh, the question will be, what, what can we produce and what can we build that fits the environment that we want to be in? And I think from a creative perspective, that's going to be a fantastic challenge. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, I have to, I see so much evidence of this, that, you know, this, 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 up and coming generation of teenagers now they they're so much more socially and environmentally aware of the planet we live on and it, it's really heartening for, for me to see how interested they are in in how we can responsibly uh, solve transportation problems moving forward i mean you and i have talked about this in our previous discussions about you called it public transport and i i said it's, it's more actually social transportation but i, I think you're absolutely right that you know, the, the next generation of, of transport designers, they've got to be thinking so much more about the bigger picture. You know, I, I've said before that the actual, you know, the transportation device, the physical commodity that conveys a person or object or cargo from one place to another is becoming a, a, an increasingly small part of the whole transportation system. And I think that companies, certainly I, will be looking for people that can have that big picture sort of point of view when they are creating new transportation design solutions. Excuse me, I'm very sorry. Let me just turn that off. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you mentioned that um, kids are jumping onto scooters rather than buying cars and so on. Well, that, that's an interesting point right now as well, isn't it? Because we knew that sort of personal mobility was already accelerating rapidly before the advent of, the pandemic that we're experiencing but i think you know, this the anxiety that exists right now around using public transportation and the need to socially distance will further amplify that growth in personal mobility solutions and i think you'll see a big rise in sort of hopefully very novel personal mobility solutions in the form of e-scooters and e-bikes and so on i'm quite excited to see what we can collectively come up with as a as an industry uh, in those areas, it's something that's kind of it's on my mind a lot right now, Martin. About you know what would I want as a personal mobility solution? What would I feel I looked you know cool at the age of fifty one on them, not and not feel like I might fall off and make a fool of myself in the park or whatever? Um, I, I think last mile solutions, as they used to be called, personal mobility solutions, they're a huge growth area and a huge opportunity moving forward, and will become increasingly important. Let me ask you this. Um, this was part of a conversation and a, a panel I was part of um, a couple of weeks ago, and I found it I found it a very interesting kind of thought process. Do you think that th through these kind of rapid changes in in the society and in, in culture, of course, as well, and everything that's connected to it, and in, in particular, obviously, mobility as well, do we think that the the promotion system in particular in creative departments would need to change to allow for the generation that you're designing for right now um, 
is is easier answer to. So I'm the way I'm seeing it that, for example, like you know, you might have a head of design that is in the you know early to mid thirties, and they're only you know spending you know five years or something like this in these positions, and then become really advisors and you know very knowledgeable on how to produce these kind of products. So going away from this, you know, okay, you've reached the peak now and like in the highest level, rather than to be we're hiring people or we're promoting people who are really at the pulse of the time uh, in that sense. Uh, I, I I found this very difficult to implement, of course, in, especially in corporate structures. But the general idea behind it is extremely interesting because that goes almost um, into this product approach to understand we need the people who live the trends because of their age uh, to really implement them and to really, you know, bring them onto on in, in in our kind of case onto the road. What, what what do you think about this? You know, from from that side. I, I think I think it's a, a very good point, Martin. And I think the tide is is shifting. Uh, you can see evidence of it. I mean, even the biggest corporations, take for example Ford, they've set up their D Ford organization, haven't they? Um, which at the moment has been set up sort of. As a separate parallel organization to the traditional or design studios, but it's to consider and address the sort of broader implications of social transportation moving forwards and how people are going to use transportation in cities and urban areas and so on and so forth. Um, so when a when a an established, you know, one of the biggest OEMs like Ford sets up an organization within its half line D Ford. And that is a sign that they are acknowledging that the way that we approach transportation design has to change. I think at the moment, the, the slightly unfortunate aspect of that is that it is separate to the design team. Now, there, there are arguments for and against that. You know, you can say, well, they shouldn't be kind of influenced or have their thoughts diluted by the traditional organization. But I would hope that they're on a path of convergence ultimately because they need to be. Um, and I think actually the design team would be very open to working with them. This is, the, the, this is just in general now. I'm not being specific about D Ford and Ford. I, say I, I applaud the fact that they've set the organization, but I just hope that they converge as a team sooner rather than later. But yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. That sort of, you know, in a generation's time, the, the design leaders within companies, I suspect, will be much more on the intellectual thinking side of the business rather than the old school traditional skill sets that characters like I have, which is, you know, they, they got to where they were because they were good creatives and they were they were good at sketching and drawing originally and that's how they progressed through the ranks. I think we're, in, we're entering a different world and I think companies are beginning to acknowledge and embrace it. Perhaps, you know, some are moving faster than others, but I do see evidence of it. Yeah. How, how do you think heritage and tradition fits into all of this when we talk about the future because you know for me it's like we're just to give you a little bit of an idea of like you know my my thought process is um if i look here in germany you know there's a lot of criticism about volkswagen for example it's like yeah they need to change they need to become much more you know techy in that kind of sense but then again it's very difficult for these companies to change a because they're just so massive so change takes a long time of course then b of course politics play a role you cannot just you know fire 50,000 people and hire 50,000 new ones just because you want to change something like that so heritage and tradition when we talk about you know uh, subscription services when we talk about service approaches in general um you know can be very difficult now uh, the UK system works a little bit differently. There's a lot of contractors in there, you know, the uh, especially compared to Germany. Of course, the, the the employee protection is not as strong as it is over here. Um, but wh where do you think, you know, the heritage and tradition is actually a plus, but also where could it be a big hindrance, especially for this next generation? I mean, you know, um, if, if I think about Jaguar, you, you think about E-types, you think about D-types, and, you know, like this is where how far you can go back and everybody knows about it. But does that even matter in the next 15, 20 years? It's it's an interesting question, uh, Martin, and I'm, I'm sure that many of my friends and ex-colleagues at uh, Jaguar Design agonize over that on a a daily basis now. I think the the 
certainly the only way that I can sort of um, reconcile it in my own mind is that you have to go back to the the core mark values that the brands were f- founded on. So, you know, um, if you take away the aesthetics of, of the products and just look at the values that led to their creation, so in the case of Jaguar, you know, in the 1960s, which is still arguably the, the golden era or the era, era when they were most progressive, uh, they were actually engineering innovators, you know, the invention of the disc brake, the uh, embracing of the monocot body with the E-type and so on. It was, it was actually engineering innovations that just so happened to come wrapped up in gorgeously designed bodies at the time. Um, so I think if... And, and maybe maybe this is too generic a comment to make because you you would argue that a lot of car manufacturers say, well, we were innovators and so on and so forth. But if you do use those kind of cornerstones of what the brand was founded on as your basis to move forward on, you know, the innovation that leads to problem solving will ultimately lead to how you provide you know more social transportation solutions within the context of specific brand i think that's how they have to approach it what it what it won't mean martin as we both know is you know creating autonomous vehicles that look vaguely like an e-type because that would just be crass and, and redundant and that isn't i'm sure that isn't what anybody intends to do um but I, I think they will have to embrace sort of you know the values that made marks great in the first place which is be innovative you know lead in the areas that you can lead in and, and also understand where where a brand's elasticity is, and that's that's very difficult for a lot of, of traditional brands to do to understand by elasticity. I mean, you know, just how far can you take the brand in any direction before it just doesn't work in the segment you're trying to position it in? Uh, Mercedes uh, have the most elastic brand in the world, as far as I can see, and as much that they credibly and successfully make trucks at one end of the scale to. Mercedes A classes and and smart cars at the other end of the scale, and then you know AMGs and CLSs at the other end, and of course the the, the dominant S class. They they can stretch that brand in any direction, and the and the brand works, but that doesn't work for all brands, uh, you know. And if, as a as somebody that still loves the Jaguar brand passionately, um, Jaguar has struggled to be so elastic when it's tried to do these kind of things. So I think it's it's going to take a lot of internal reflection and and just being kind of honest about the opportunities that are available for the established brands. Um, you're right, the, the sort of contracts of working versus um, permanent staff working in the UK versus Germany, that may give brands some more flexibility to rescale and so on and, and rehire. But the core teams are, are permanent staff in the UK as well. The, the people that set the tone and kind of set the tempo of how brands will move forward. They, they'll remain on board regardless. So I think they've got the same kind of challenges as the as the German OEMs as well. It's, it's going to be a difficult one. You know, providing premium solutions for social transportation requirements is, is almost a $6 million question, isn't it, really? Yeah, and, uh, and I think it, it's something for me is where – really design leadership needs to stand up as well because it's also about understanding you know the business and emotion uh to put it like this uh when when it's about services when it's about you know what kind of changes can we drive forward i think the design department throughout everything and you know all all all, all departments in in, in a manufacturer would have so much insights. I mean, like this is this is something for me. It's like the design department is connected with almost everything. And it's connected with I would say the most departments overall compared to the the rest of the company. And if you have that kind of ability, you know, it's almost like you need within this creative department almost what I would probably call like a, you know, a business designer. So people who understand the idea of what could the company be and uh, you know, I'm you could call it a think tank, you could call it an innovation hub or something like that. But generally speaking, like that creativity and that the design department should evolve not only in the idea of, you know, we have a haptic product, we have a physical product, but also, you know, what can design do to to build new business areas and and really show as well like how, you know, 
an entire design language and this can then you know go from 2d to 3d to apps to everything that you can imagine um is uh, is consistent with the with the plan because i think that's sometimes a little bit missing you know and that a lot of creative designers and i'm I'm now speaking a little bit more broadly not just for the transportation design industry forget that there's a business behind it um because of the the nature and their let's say you know fortune that they're allowed to work in a creative environment but if we in, in implement this kind of business thinking into the design department you know it might it might also inspire the physical designers to to think differently about the products that they're working on and and this is something for me fundamental like in terms of developing country, uh, companies that uh, you know these ideas have to come from somewhere and oftentimes they come from external companies you know just like hey you could do this you could do that but um, I, I I always believe or I'm a very very strong believer that the best ideas come from the people that work in the company because the emotion of you know pushing it onto the next level is the strongest there and the emotion that you want to portray towards your user, um, you know, is is the strongest that when it comes from the people that are actually working there because they know they know it best. Yeah, absolutely. You need you need you need invested characters that have a passion for the brand to to push these ideas through. But you also need those characters to be realistic and and acknowledging of of the changing world we're in as well, don't you? So that they they don't kind of doggedly stick to some of their kind of preconceived ideas about what the brand should be if they don't apply moving forwards. You know, as, as I say, with, with premium brands, it's it's about how you can extend the, the, the luxury experience around a subscription service moving forward. You know, the, the, the creative thinking for me right now has to be as much focused on, on that. What is the offer? What is the experience that will define this premium brand from a another brand that will make you want to subscribe to it over you know a, a, a higher volume manufacturer you know that that's where the thought needs to be focused and as you say the collaboration between the design teams and the marketing teams the communication team the research teams it really has to be very 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 well integrated to to make the most of the opportunity that we have now because we're in such a transitory um, situation in the world of transportation design right now. Now is the time to be brave and start mapping out what that future could be for the various brands. Um, interestingly, as well, you mentioned Arrival earlier on, and, and I admire Arrival greatly. I, uh, I I think they've they've demonstrated that a company you know can be a startup. From what I can see of the staff there, and I know some of the people working there, they're a very young team. They haven't come from a predominantly automotive background. They just they're, they're doing what their generation intuitively feels is right for a company like Arrival at this point in history, and seem to be doing it very well. And and maybe that's where the you know the established OEMs could learn a little bit. Maybe they have to recruit more people outside of the traditional disciplines into their businesses to, to give them that insight. Um, even down to the, the very design language of arrival, I, some people say oh, it might be too toy like. I think it's charming, and I think it's absolutely spot on for what they're trying to achieve. I I, I do admire them a lot. Yeah, and I mean, look, this is this is the thing for me is like where I think the uh, the challenge for the UK market lies, and uh, you know, regardless of uh, political things and COVID at the moment, but we have. On the one side, we have a rival. Of course, we had Dyson, um, which uh, which James Dyson then uh, then stopped as the project itself. But there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm and uh, you know and push from from the, the from these new kids on the block as well. And then, of course, you know if you look into London in particular, which for me is one of the mobility cities number one. I think TfL. Um, Transport for London for all of our uh, you know non UK listeners or like non um, the guys who are not very familiar with London is a very strong institution when it comes to pushing new mobility solutions and um, I I, I want to throw a question out there and uh, obviously everybody knows the London the London taxi but do you think it was a sign a little bit from 
from you know like the general kind of audience to say like we're doing the new London taxi with uh, with Geely and maybe not with the with the established brands do you think that you know that was also a sign look we're looking for partners that are flexible and can you know can can do something that we would like them to do rather than you know we go to established big companies in the UK because they could have easily gone to you know Jaguar Land Rover of course as a, as a whole they could have gone uh, you know push Lotus a little bit further all these kind of things before they were bought obviously by Geely but is do you think that's a little bit of a sign and like you know where the industry in the UK is going right now with uh, with the example of the London taxi? Um, well, I think it's, it's a bit of a tricky one that one is because, of course, Geely bought LTI, London Taxis International, of course, who manufactured the previous London Taxi. So, although although TFL may have been talking to Geely, it was probably because of their connections with LTI previously that that conversation started. So. There was a historical but it, link there, but I. But I they could have gone to Jaguar. They could have gone to Jaguar and just say, like, look, we we, we would like you to to design the um the, the new London taxi. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think my kind of take on it would be that I think what's very good about Transport for London is that they, they've taken a very careful view of how transport in London should look and feel, and how it should, you know, have the street furniture work together in London and you know the the latest route master buzz obviously was inspired and, and clearly can be seen to be by the original route master and in the same way I think that TFL wanted a taxi that would be recognizably related to its predecessors because they considered the importance of of that aesthetic on the streets of London, you know, a bit like the red telephone boxes, Buckingham Palace, etc. They they have a brand in London that they want to protect with the, the assets, let's call them that, that they put into the city. So I, I, I don't think that it was a, a decision taken lightly. I think there was consideration put into it, but I also do think we have to acknowledge the fact that Geely had bought the previous London Taxi manufacturer, and then I think that was a connection there. But I, I think they were looking for a vehicle that looked like a London cab. I do. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, you know, if we look into Arrival now, obviously they're trying to challenge that a little bit with uh, the way they were doing things. Of course, Dyson doing 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 the way they do it and stuff like that. Um, do you think that in in the long term, these these new kids on the block, you know, can can really challenge the the established companies because of this? you know, new way of doing things, the speed that they can work towards, obviously the size that they that they have as well. Uh do they do they really become a you know a, a danger to the to the established guys or is, is the danger, you know, for for JLR uh, and the Bentleys and uh, the Astons of the world coming from 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 somewhere else and not even from inside the UK? I think um it depends on how you measure success really Martin, doesn't it? Because You know, if we look at what Arrival have achieved so far in their relatively short life as a company and the investment they've attracted, the, the huge contracts they've attracted from, you know, parcel couriers and so on and so forth, then so far it seems that they, you know, they are going to be a profitable business. Uh, they've taken the approach to manufacturing that they'll establish these micro factories that will kind of, I assume assemble knockdown kits of their vehicles where they need to do so. So they've, they've rethought the whole kind of design into engineering, into manufacturing, into supply chain. They've, thought, they've rethought the whole process as to how you would deliver vehicles moving forwards. Um, are they a competitor to you know, Jaguar Land Rover, Aston Martin and so on? I, I guess not at the moment because they're not they're not trying to sell comparable commodities, even though they're all in the transportation design world. I guess it depends on, you know, let's let's talk about Jaguar Land Rover because they have the Vector platform, the you know, that they went public with a few months ago. So they, they you know, they are looking at their own sort of um, skateboard platform vehicle. It depends on how successful that is and whether that becomes more of a competitor for arrival and then comparisons will inevitably be drawn. Um, but I think the traditional manufacturers in the UK, the Astons, the Jaguars, the Bentleys, and so on, um, they exist in sort of a, a premium area at the moment, which I think for the customers they have, you know, 
tend to be more mature because that's when you acquire the wealth to be able to purchase their products. Uh, that isn't going to change anytime soon. So, you know, I don't see there's a lot of value right here, right now in Aston Martin, for example, trying to make a, an e-scooter, although it'd be fun if they did. Uh, that would be quite cool. But I think there'll be a while yet before the arrivals of this world are kind of compared directly to the JLRs and the Astons and so on. Yeah, I actually retract that. I think um, Aston Martin, it would be cool if they did do an e-scooter. Um, it's a brand that maybe could do that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you know, there's. I, I think if we if we take this a little bit further, and we we had this in an earlier discussion as well, but like you know, there's so much potential in the UK as well with, you know, let's call them dead brands uh, at the moment. <laughs> you know, brands that are not not really being used. You can you can think about Austin Healy. You can you know think about a few others, of course, as well. Um, but with this kind of time that we have right now, we have electrification. We have. Uh, you know, like platform sharing from the big companies. We have the ability of still coach building uh, very strongly in the UK, which I believe alongside Italy, uh, it's probably worldwide the best kind of way of, if you want to coach build a car um, in, in, in terms of just the quality and the knowledge that everything comes with it. Do you see um, in Germany, we've had, you know, Borgward being resurrected a few years ago. Do you, do you see that there's enough potential to resurrect one or two of the old brands um, in, you know, in the UK, or would you say just like, you know, leave them be and uh, let's start something from scratch to not carry out this heritage? Because it's almost like it would be a shame to not do something with them, but at the same time to, to do something new, it's almost better to leave them to leave them in the grave. Yeah, I think. Well, there's there's two two parts to that question, Martin. That I'll, I'll I'll answer separately. I think moving forwards, the, the the skateboard platform as a commodity, I think we might find ourselves in a situation where there are a couple of dominant suppliers of those platforms, potentially, that then would open the door, and I'm hypothesizing here, would open the door for coach building companies or smaller brands to then put their own bodies onto those skateboard platforms for whatever uses they saw fit, whether it was a, you know, um, whether it was a, a, a subscription taxi or whether it was a two-seater sports car or whatever it might be. But I think you know, if we if we hypothesize that skateboard platforms became the norm, that would enable the return of coach building and the return of smaller manufacturers to do something unique and offer it on on those architectures. Uh, and that's an interesting and exciting possibility. Now, is it worth resurrecting some of the default brands, particularly in the area where I live in Coventry right now? I honestly don't know, because those brands are only relevant to people of my age and older, unless unless it's a, a young kid that's got a very specific enthusiasm for uh, old British marks. Um, so... Do I think that there's a, a need to do that or would it be better off or would it be better off creating new brands? I suspect it's probably the latter, if I'm honest, because you know people that are passionate about triumphs and so on tend to be my age or older. Um, if I say triumph to my, you know, nine year old kids, they wouldn't have a clue what I meant and, and they're in the <laughs> So so yeah, yeah, I think I think the two answers I would give is I think there is an opportunity for a resurgence in lower volume coach built manufacturing in the UK because there are plenty of organisations around in this area that can do it and do it well. Uh, would this lead to a resurgence of historical brands? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure whether it's it's necessary or whether there'd be an audience wanting it. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's my thoughts. Well, I think what what we could see is um similar to i think aston have done it um is you know the turning an old car into a new electric version uh aston's done it with the db6 um jaguar did it before them with the e-tag 
Exactly. And, uh, you know, there's alternative methods of doing that. It could be electric, could be hydrogen, whatever you can think of. So, uh, you know, to, and obviously there's a lot of arguments in saying like these old brands, this is the only way for them to survive is, uh, you know, a little bit like the Morgan style. You keep, you keep a relatively old design and you just update it based on technology. Um, but you know, the, 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 the shape stays exactly the same. And you just put the latest technology in it. Uh, you can you can say you can make a business out of this with you know as as Singer does, of course. They 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 take usually nine six four Porsches, and uh, and make them new and make them you know uh, fully digitalized in the sense of like you know the, the latest technology in there. That's what I could see, but you know that 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 that's something that I mean you know R four refor you know reforged I think are doing that with electrification and stuff like that. But you know someone like Ian Cullum with his um, uh, you know, Vanquish 25 project could do something similar and just say like, look, we'll, we'll make these cars into electric cars. So I think the potential is definitely there. The, the knowledge, of course, and, you know, the the, the qualifications of the people um, doing that is definitely still there. It's then just a question of, you know, who who's going to do it? Not, ev- not everybody can be Ian. <laughs> uh, and again, Mark, and I think it's also, you know, how big is the market for those vehicles? Because it... Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, it, I mean, the Cars like that are, are high end and high high value, so they're exclusive by definition. So there will be some people that want it, and there, there are, as you say, there are lots of companies now converting classics or remanufacturing classics with electric powertrains. I personally find it quite fun, and I, and I certainly, if you if you pardon the pardon the pun, I have no resistance to electric classics at all. Um, but whether there's a much of a market, you know, going back to our previous discussion about the sort of next generation of consumers and designers, whether there's appeal for for them in what we're discussing, sort of retro cars with electric powertrains, I honestly don't know. Um, you know there's another company, Charge, in the UK, isn't it, which is electrifying late 60s fastback Mustangs with carbon bodies. Which again, it looked pretty cool to me. I, I, I kind of get it, but... I don't. I don't know what the size of the market needs to be for companies like that to to succeed. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's it's also the question of how much they cost. I think you know it's uh, you know if if you only produce ten or fifteen of them, but they cost like half a million plus, then you know you have a very limited amount of um, of people. But if you if you start let's say offering electric e types for 100 grand i mean you know there was like what 70000 e types built back in the back in the 60s and 70s um that that would be a completely different kind of yeah. you know yeah. uh, attraction point i think yeah. it's 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 this kind of accessibility and I, and i agree i think you know a lot of a lot of young kids if they if they grow up with electric cars and they see old cars but electrified they would love to have that. I think you know it's it's this is the kind of passion. It's not just about the engine anymore. Um, for a lot of people, it's about the shape. And if we can main, if we can keep the shape in the public picture, I think uh, then 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 that would be a fantastic kind of idea moving forward. But you know, it it, it de- depends on the young the young kids if they wanna if they wanna have that like 15, 20 years from now, or if they just say like, hey, if I want to have the real deal, I you know I, I want to have the smell of oil and petrol uh, when I'm sitting in these cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, who, who knows uh, how that conversation will go? I mean, clearly there are a lot of kind of very, very low volume manufacturers that are are investing in the electric classics um, market at the moment. So we'll have to say, as I say, personally, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, would I buy one? I don't know. I guess it depends on how much money I've got floating around to to sort of indulge on something like that, but. Yeah, we, we would have to see, but yeah, it's if if we're looking at the sort of next generation of car consumers, the teenagers that that are kind of getting to an age where they can have their driving licenses now, and I do wonder what would appeal to them because all the evidence is pointing towards the fact that they're much more likely to go for subscribed services, isn't it? So I think the immediate challenge for us as designers in the, in the car industry is is, is to how how to make a a total service appeal more than another to a teenager that doesn't want to own their own car, for example. Uh, I think that's the bigger challenge right now. 
Exactly, and um, I think this is the, the, this kind of challenge should be something for us to discuss maybe in part two uh, of the podcast because we've been in it for like over fifty minutes already, and uh, <laughs> we need to make sure that you know we, uh, we 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 don't keep the people for too long. Um, as we know, an hour is usually the best kind of time to listen to uh, you know guys like us. But before I let you go. And uh, I, I will come back to this question of like, you know, um, if you would have any money, what car would you get? So don't, don't you worry. Um, every guest on the show is going to get three questions and uh, you will get them as well. There's no way of getting around that. And my first question to you is the following. Um, which project that you did not take part of, would you have absolutely been you know, would you absolutely, absolutely love to be part of? And uh, this could be anything. Doesn't need to be a car. Oh, okay. Um, oh, in that case, it would probably be architecture. I would have loved to have been part of Zaha Habib's team on something like the um, the uh, Cracky. She's done so many brilliant buildings the opera house in china for example that that would have been amazing to work on or actually you know because i love new york as well it would have been wonderful to have been involved in the creation of something like the chrysler building in that golden art deco era that's a building that still stuns me whenever i see it as well especially with all of the the metal cladding when the sun hits it so yeah being involved in the in the creation of a significant building, be it historic or otherwise, that would have been something that I'd have liked to have done. All right. Question number two. Which designer, and this can again be anybody and don't have to, you know, have had the experience to work with them, has had the biggest influence on you and your career? From a very early age, I was hugely inspired by Jujaro. Uh, and I've owned what I love about Jujaro is he's done some stunning supercars, but actually his best work has been the high volume, affordable, practical cars. So first generation Golf. I'm a huge Lancia Delta fan. I had three Integrales and HF Turbos and HF all wheel drives before that. I've had Golfs as well. Uh, I just think that Jujaro, he's been able to design the most affordable cars and the most exotic cars. And he's done it so successfully at, at both ends of the scale. So he's, he's been the biggest inspiration to me. And he was one of the reasons I wanted to be a car designer. Last but not least, and this is, uh, you know, coming back to the million dollar question, of course, if I would give you a blank check, which one car would you buy? Ferrari 288 GTO. <laughs> that was quick uh, was. and i think I, I i actually think that was the quickest answer we've ever we've ever had for this question <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's an easy one it's just i remember it coming out when i was 14 15 years old i i previously loved the 308 gtb that it was derived from i remember seeing a pin and farina advertisement in a yachting magazine that the a local dealer of a um, the local Rolls Royce dealer where I grew up in Stoke on Trent. He was a friend of my uncle's, so he used to bring home these exotic yachting magazines with Reavers and such like in them. And there was an advert for Pininfarina in there with the silhouette of a 308 GTB, and it would have been about 1977, I'm guessing. And I was just awestruck. So again, that was another <laughs> memory that got me into cars. Uh, and then when they produced the 288 GTO, which is just you know, it's a 308 GTB that's been to the gym. Um, it, I just love that car. And it's just stayed with me whenever I see when I turn back into my 14-year-old self and just <laughs> I remember building models of it. And yeah, yeah, just love that car. And what would be the color of choice? Would it be red or yellow? Uh, red for me. <laughs> yeah. In the we case of the GTO, clean. funnily enough, when I owned a 308 GTB, I had a silver one because it showed the design off to best effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, cool. a red, a red two eight eight GTO, please, Martin. If I if I have that blank check, I'll let you know. I'll send you a text <laughs> message, and then we'll we'll, we'll go shopping together. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Wayne, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time. It's been almost an hour, and I I, I really appreciated 
you know you you uh, you sharing all your thoughts with uh, with all of the listeners. Thank you very much. No, it's been an absolute pleasure, Martin. Thank you, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, I always enjoy talking to you. You know. You're most welcome. And uh, to all of our listeners, we hope, uh, both Wayne and I hope, of course, that you had uh, as fun as we did with the recording of this episode of the Gestalten Podcast. And as always, if you follow us slash listen to us on iTunes, uh, do not forget to give us five stars because that helps to push us up. If you listen to us on any other platform that has a rating system, the same goes for this. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions uh, for Wayne, we will, of course, link his profile, his LinkedIn profile onto the show notes so that you can get in touch with him. But uh, for now, that what is, was it from us. Thanks for listening and you will hear back from us in a couple of weeks time. Take care. Mm -hmm.